what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same and right now. I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiringinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today I have Ralph Burns of Tier 11. I always like to, Ralph, talk about other episodes that people should check out. Um, and our mutual friend, Ian Garlic, thanks for introducing Ian uh, Garlic. Uh, introduced today's guest and check him out, Story Cruise and uh, video case stories. Uh, Wes Matthews talks about selling his agency, growing and selling it. Todd Tasky was on. You know, basically that's his niche. He actually just helps sell agencies and he has a second bite podcast where he, uh, you know, brings them to private equity and sometimes they make more on the second bite, which is kind of cool. And the Littlefield agency, they've been doing it for over 41 years and they talk about succession planning because his son took it over. So that was kind of cool to hear. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce Ralph in a second more formally, but this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. At Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. We are an easy button for people to launch and run their podcast. And I'm going to talk about Ralph's podcast because they have had over 8 million downloads. And, you know, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I've found no better way than to profile them, their company, their thought leadership on my podcast and let everyone know what they are doing and add value to the world. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. I've been saying that for over a decade. Uh, if you have questions, you go to rise25.com and uh, email us if you have anything. I see you nodding there, uh, Ralph, too. I agree. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, Ralph Burns is the founder and CEO of Tier 11, uh, their digital marketing agency that uses a proprietary system called the Customer Acquisition Amplification. And what it does is unlocks the online potential of a purpose-driven business to help them scale and grow. They are, which sounds in this environment normal, but they've been doing it for a long, long time, 100% virtual agency with people in over 25 countries. And they manage a portfolio of social media advertising accounts in over 57 industries with an annual spend in excess of $100 million. And this podcast, as I mentioned, Perpetual Traffic, has been downloaded over 8 million times and helps people grow their business through online traffic and conversion strategies. Ralph, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me on. Great to be here. So let's give a shout out to some of your episodes. What are some of the favorite guests uh, on Perpetual Traffic? Oh, well, it's definitely Ian Garlic. Uh, <laughs> no. He's been on twice. Goes without so. saying. Oh, wow. yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, he introduced us, so that's great. But no, actually, his stuff is is really really good. It, one of the one of the most fun shows I think we ever actually did. I have a relatively newish host within the last three to four or five months, Kasab Aslam, which we have a lot of fun doing these sorts of things. I, I would say probably just um, you know any of the episodes in the last three to four months. I think those are the best ones. Are there any done. fan favorites that stick out that come up even over the years uh, that yeah. people keep saying, oh, they come, keep going back to that one? Yeah, I think it's episode 145. Like that was a long time ago, but it's still actually something that we use to this very day. It was about how we sort of divvy up traffic on Facebook and it still stands to this, this very moment. We were just actually on a, on a team call and they, they, so lo and behold, and I had never been into this campaign for uh, what one of our media buyers was talking about on our team call, but lo and behold, it was set up exactly like the ad amplifier system, which we talked about way back on 145. So go back and check that out. That's an oldie, but a goodie, but we've since updated some of the information on that in the last year or so. But, um, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our listeners are very tactical and Oh, so we try and give some strategic advice as well as super tactical things. And with all the changes in digital media and digital advertising in the last three to six months, I would say the most recent episodes are maybe the ones that are even more relevant to maybe some of your listeners. Cool. Yeah. And we're going to dig into some case stories. And there's an amazing one where someone went from spending 20,000 pounds a month to 200,000 pounds a month. There's a couple simple things you help them with. It always seems simple when you know what you're doing, I guess. But um, and talking about virtual team, running a virtual team, um, I wanted to kind of start with your journey a little bit because um, 
you've been doing this for a long time now. And um, what does Christian men dating uh, have to do with your journey? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. That's a blast from the past. Well, that actually was the affiliate offer that I spent. I think it was $3,000 on one night that I didn't have any caps on or spend caps on my Facebook ad account. The first time I ever ran Facebook ads. So uh, good for you doing your research on that one. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's when I realized that even though I had a horrible landing page and not a very well converting offer, nor were my ads really all that good. I realized that there's a lot of people on Facebook and this was back in 2009, uh, 2010, maybe like right around that time, maybe like January, 2010, when Facebook had the right hand rail ads and I was an affiliate, that's how I was sort of getting into what I eventually are doing right now is that I sold affiliate offers by eating what I killed, I suppose. In this case, it was uh, leads for Christian Mingle, which is just my wife hates when I tell this story, but it's true <laughs> because I was just struck. I had to figure out a way to make money because I just did not want to go back to the corporate world after getting fired twice. And uh, there was no way that I could actually go and work for somebody else. So I was, I was, I was absolutely committed. I had burned the boats on the beach, so to speak. And thankfully my wife had a pretty good job. So I wasn't starving per se, even though we had some young kids that were eating a whole lot and could have eaten us out of house and home at that point in time. But yeah, so the, uh, the Christian mingle uh, offer was one that I first tried on Facebook and uh, it was great because there was the only really the type of targeting that was on Facebook was how old somebody was, where they lived, what their marital status was, and if they're interested in men, women, or other, I guess at that point, or if they were single. And I'm like, well, this is great for a dating offer. And then a year or two later, Facebook changed all that with really super specific targeting, which they still have to this day. But yeah, that was my first foray into Facebook ads and went full-time as an agency in 2012, just because the platform was so damn good and it still is today. So. I guess when someone's choosing an offer, sex, money, health are all good uh, categories to, to look at. When you go back, Ralph, if you went back right now to that time, what would you do differently with running the ads or maybe creating auxiliary materials? What would you do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they say it's now you have it. a lot of expertise. So, right, right. It's health, wealth, and relationships, I suppose, like the three big categories. But I suppose I would have worked on my landing page a little bit more. And I would have learned a little bit more of the rules of how to do stop loss and how to do spend limits on Facebook. And I, I think that was, that was something that they had back then. But if I knew what I know now, I think um, that was a big, it was more of a, like a, just a revelation that this was another traffic source. Because I think, you know, when I was an affiliate at that point in time, I was doing two things. I was buying display. I was literally calling up, if you can believe this, calling up websites that had uh, content that was similar to the offer that I was trying to sell. And I would buy space literally on the phone with the website owner. I don't even know how I got their name and number, but somehow I did. I think I did a who is lookup or whatever it happens to be. And that's how I started. So I was looking for like a really, really reliable traffic source. Because I was, you were placing like a banner ad on a site yeah. that you knew that that's genius. I mean, people, it, people could do that today, like go on like SEM Rush or something, find out what, you know, obviously you could, you buy at scale with, with ad networks, but right. you could approach some site and say, I, I just want to put this banner on your site that doesn't. Yeah. I, I remember that the site was like, when it was W H W A H M, work at home moms. And I was selling a work at home program that was specific for females. So this was a different offer, not the one on Christian Mingle. But the point was, is I did get a banner placed on their site because they ranked really well organically, I, I believe, for work at home mothers or work at home products. So I just figured out, okay, one, two, three, anything above the fold, I'm going to call all those because I want those keywords. I don't want to have to pay for them through pay-per-click. And that's how I got even more traffic. And then I eventually figured out a way in which to actually pay for those keywords with the affiliate offers, which led to a few Google ad account bans, which um, <laughs> I probably, are, you know, 
that still sort of haunts me to this day. Every now if I use a certain email, like these bad, bad things happen inside Google. But anyway, we don't need to let them know that. But I think you just have to gut it out. It's like you just got to figure out a way to do it. Like there's, there was no turning back. And I was going to do whatever it took in order to make this thing work because my back was to the wall. I did not want to go back working for somebody else, working for a-holes, which is what I was doing at that point in time and, and make this thing a go of it. And here we are today, you know, 10 plus years later. Jeff, one of the things you, you know, when I look at your site, you do traffic. You also um, talk to people about conversion optimization. I mean, you're forced into that in some respect because you want, you could drive as much traffic as possible, but if it, they're, site or landing page is terrible, then your work is for nothing. So I'd love to hear some mistakes people make with landing pages um, and your thoughts around that. Yeah, it's interesting. We actually, we just, uh, we just hired a, a, a great guy that uh, we talked to exactly about this today. It was sort of this first week and I, you know, the, one of the things that we do when people come on board is that they have a call with me just to kind of check in and I'm not necessarily part of the interviewing process because we have people that do that. And he said, you know, it's great that tier 11 does all this after the click stuff because so many agencies don't do it. And I think a lot of agencies don't do it or nor do they even pay any attention to it. It's like everything up to the click, that's our job. And then everything after the click, that's your job, Mr. Customer or Mr. Business Owner. And I think it's somewhat negligent of, a, of an agency to not at least give some insight into what they think will work after the click. And when I was first starting this back in 2012, 2013, I would do the ads and I would also create the landing pages. And that's how I did it. And then I think we all became so specialized and just got away from it. And about two plus years ago, we realized that, all right, traffic costs are going up. Nothing's getting cheaper. There's lots of competition. And we swung back to doing that. And we still now do that to this day. We always advise customers on what to do. And that's why we hire super, you know, we hire super smart media buyers that also understand conversion. But now we offer all of that as a service. And we've been doing that as sort of a package deal for the last couple of years. And it's worked out really well. Father, what mistakes do people make? I don't know if there's a site that sticks out to you. I could even pull one up. I should have asked you before of maybe when you go to it, you frequent, it just gets to you like you want them to, you know, if they change this or this, it would, it would improve. Or what are some of the common things you see people doing wrong with their landing pages? Yeah. I mean, I think you can go to, you know, just about any, I hate to generalize, but any big brand where there's a pay-per-click ad and just do a Google search and then click from whatever search term that you put in and look at their landing page. And there usually isn't any sort of resonance between the message and the ad that you just clicked on and the page that you got to. And I still think you have to have resonance between what I'm expecting and what actually happens once you click. Because unless you're using you know, an in-platform in measurement tool or an in-platform device like you know, Instagram shopping or Facebook shops where everything is on the platform, you still have to do the work after the click. And that, like the job of an advertiser is not just a one-sided part to things. So I think any pay-per-click ad, like, yeah, Home I'm Depot. I'm just, I don't know why that stuck more. out to me. I, I just put Home Depot, you know, obviously they have an ad running here. And it so takes that is, to, that's a branded yeah. search ad. So that, yeah. that would be, all right, like, let's say I want, I don't know. Maybe like, I should do like tools or something. A drill or like a power saw or something like that. You would expect that one of the first ads from Home Depot would actually have a drill or a power saw. Or yeah, once you get past your, saws, Home your, your Depot. Google shopping. So there's a good example of one right there. If you click that. But in a lot of cases, that a good? lot of that's actually if you load that page, chances are, yeah, you've actually got you've got a good message match here. Like this yeah. is something that if they're just sending to a home page, mm. which is what a lot of other businesses do, we're giving a good example here. Like this is exactly what you want. Now, if you are looking for a Ryobi circular saw, you should have a page that has 
Ryobi circular saw as soon as you click to it. Mm -hmm. The point is, is like a lot of businesses, we see this all the time. There's a, there's a penalty that Google will, will inflict upon you if they back click immediately, if there's a high bounce rate. It's the same thing with Facebook ads. We see it all the time. Probably a better example in our space and what we specialize in because we add on Google on top of Facebook and Instagram typically is that we see a lot of ads in our newsfeed that are maybe very you know, stock footage images, and then you click off and it's something completely different. And that kind of message, mm. lack of that lack of resonance really does not do anything but just punish you to paying higher CPMs and lower conversion rates at the end of the day. So basically, if I did click through, a lot of brands would basically just send me to a general page and there's no match to what I was just seeing to the, the next thing that I'm seeing. Exactly. It's like a shock to the system for you, which, which doesn't help anyone. It's a wasted click. And I mean, the more specific you can get on your keyword phrases, obviously the, the landing page that you're sending them to, that's just sort of the basics of pay-per-click. The same kind of thing goes on in social. I mean, it, in the case of the Ryobi Circular Saw, you have an intent-based ad there. You're looking for something. You're, you maybe are, have been thinking about purchasing for quite some time. And then, all right, now I've narrowed down my search. Ryobi is the one that I want. It's cordless. It's in my price range. So you're very close to buying. So you have to make it really, really easy for that visitor to make the purchase or go to the store, find the store location so you can go pick it up. Same thing sort of happens in Facebook ads. The difference is, is that with Facebook ads, it's interruption marketing. It's showing in your feed because you've shown some sort of proclivity or interest, or you've clicked on a page or your web search or something in your profile would indicate that you might be interested in that particular product or service. I want to talk about, you know, I mentioned on the, the front of the interview about there were two things. Then there was this jewelry company. Talk a little bit about what happened with that. Yeah, I mean, this is a jewelry company that's based in the UK and uh, a, a great customer, somebody that we really enjoy working with because they they get it. They're like, all right, listen, we're we're doing okay with what we're currently doing because we have good products. And they were spending, the way that we sort of look at things is when, when a, a new customer comes to us, we make an assessment, we call the strategic growth plan, but it's basically, it's an assessment of where they've been, where they're at right now, where they want to go. And in the where they want to go, we make recommendations. So we diagnose what the issue is. We prescribe a solution in this strategic growth plan. And then we implement that solution when they come on board. And then we iterate on it as time goes on, as they bring out new products. So this customer was actually was doing pretty well for the type of product that's in the you know thousands of dollar range. Like these are engagement rings, eternity rings, blue sapphire rings, like really expensive items. And they were, because their product was so good, they were literally just sending traffic right from the image of the blue sapphire ring right to a blue sapphire ring page where they could, the, the, the customer or the prospect could just purchase. And that worked okay. They were breaking even. With that, which which isn't bad. Like if you're breaking even on the front end sale, especially with a, a product that's, you know, in this case, it's all in pounds, it's not dollars, but it's thousands of pounds, you're doing pretty good. So when we made the assessment of, all right, can we scale and grow these guys? We knew that they had an offer that had some legs. It was at least backing out to a certain degree. But in our assessment, we saw that there was this smaller campaign with a really small spend that, and in our analysis, we saw that this was doing this small campaign with maybe a couple hundred dollars in spend, did really well with huge click through rates, had some pretty good return on ad spend. I believe it was about two to three X. So they were spending a dollar and they were getting about two to three X in return, but they hadn't really scaled it up. So in our part of our analysis or part of our sort of diagnosis of what the issue was, we said, okay, you're trying to scale and grow. So what we recommend is we recommend instead of sending all your traffic on Facebook, cold traffic, not looking for your product. Once again, interruption-based marketing, nobody's going into Facebook typing in, I want to buy a wedding ring or I want to buy an eternity ring. So we put videos and images in the newsfeed 
in their ads, but instead of sending them to a product page, we would entice them with a little bit more of a story of the company itself. And in one particular case, we actually created an entire blog post on one of the royals, which I'm not really much of a royal person, don't really follow any of that, but uh, this Kate, Kate Middleton ring, that was this beautiful like sapphire ring. And we, we created a whole blog post around this ring. And inside the blog post, there was what my friend Russ Henneberry refers to as Johnson boxes, which is, you know, click here to learn more about rings similar to this one, or, you know, hyperlinked other links, very not salesy. You know, we made it, we kind of squashed the, the right hand rail on the blog post a little bit to the side and eliminated some of the things that would click off. But what we noticed is that once we redid this blog post and put a story behind it, all of a sudden we weren't getting just a 0.8 return on ad spend. All of a sudden we started to get two, three, four X return. And the best part was, is that when we combine this with a second campaign of people who had clicked, landed on that page, that blog post, and then we retargeted them with just pure product ads, like really simple stuff. This is not rocket science by any stretch, uh, Jeremy. I mean, this is like really kind of simple. We're like, wow, the combination of the two allowed them to 10X their monthly ad spend in the month of November. And they ended up pulling in about 1.5 million in revenue in the month of November. Now that was a great month. That's a Black Friday month. They had a great sale going on. They had a really good product. Do we take credit for the 10X? You know, no, it was us in combination with putting a strategy together that really works to sell people in the right way and realize like you need another touch point before you ask for the sale. But the sale at that point was kind of a given. They had already showed interest. They had clicked through a lot of the links to a lot of the products and we put in our retargeting, we put in our e-com ad amplifier system or what we now call the traffic harmonizer system. We harmonized it with all their, we did their Google ads, we did Facebook ads, everything kind of worked together. And now this customer is, is selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of these rings every single month profitably on the first transaction, not to mention all the mm. stuff they make in the back end once they become a customer, which is the real reason why you run Facebook ads and why you're trying to grow and scale is acquiring customers and then sell them over and over again or upsell them, you know, with certain different service offerings and that kind of thing. And that's sort of our goal as an agency is to do that for, for purpose-driven companies that we really believe in, have a great story. And this case is a, a good example of that. And so the two things would be really double downing on creating a, an amazing blog post with a lot of content and then doing retargeting to anyone who hits that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that's the, the easiest thing to do oftentimes is to take your best piece of content and just put it on your page and just post on a regular basis and then maybe boost it with a couple of bucks. In this case, a couple of pounds, like $5. Because what you'll find out is you'll find out which content, which front end hook message will give you an indication as to what maybe you should create ads around and then put hundreds of thousands of dollars behind it. And it's a really easy way for you as a business owner to get a signal initially. Like this is a few dollars a day. Now my friend Dennis Yu says this, just boost a post for a couple of bucks a day. Absolutely, that's what you should do. You have to kind of create content on a regular basis. We do it at tier 11, we, we do that as well for all of our customers and our customers Remember, like uh, an ad on Facebook is a page post. It is a post from your page. So the more content you actually have on your Facebook page, the friendlier Facebook typically is for you. And if you have engagement on those posts, even better. But the ones with the most engagement, like a 5%, 7%, 10% engagement rate, which is really easy to see inside your page insights, like those are ones you might want to actually turn into an ad. Because people are engaging with it, as long as it's relating to your product or service, it's a really good, low-cost way to start. Yeah. A lot of people will ask me, Ralph, should I create a webinar? Is a webinar right? Do you have any 
good uh, case stories to talk about on kind of how you structure a webinar funnel and, and the type of industry it was in? Yeah, webinars still work. I mean, I think there, there was a time when people thought that Webinars maybe had had their day. They still work to this day. Uh, we're in the throes of one right now for a customer uh, in the education space. And, you know, this is the, the lead gen component of webinars, I think, is really, really important. I think sending cold traffic to a webinar, depending on what your space is, is far more challenging from a cost per acquisition or a cost per registration. Phase, but I, I think one of the things that we've noticed, and we have a lot of customers that do webinars, either whether it's evergreen or whether it's episodic, this one in particular is using one that's, that's um, you know, it's a launch right now using a webinar, using a, a chunky piece of educational content to ultimately sell, not an extremely high uh, ticket item, but, you know, hundreds of dollars, several hundred dollars for, for the ask, uh, is to create leads to constantly be creating lists of leads, always doing that, always creating some kind of way to create warmish audiences. And those warmish audiences could be video views. One of the other strategies that we use with this jewelry customer is that we started to do video posts that they might not sell on that post itself or on that ad. But what we could do is if they engaged a certain percentage of the video, that's a pretty warm audience. And that's an audience that's on Facebook. iOS doesn't change that. You still capture all those audiences. It's literally, it's first party data you're taking from Facebook. And then you can retarget those people for your webinar, for sort of that next step. If you're constantly out there gathering leads, we do it at tier 11. We, we, we do a lead gen campaign. It's evergreen. We change it up every now and then. And then we email, we use two, the two in combination with each other, especially if you're trying to sell a high ticket item, people that are cold to you don't know who you are and you're trying to sell them two, three, four thousand dollar $4,000 products, you're going to have a hard time selling them to cold traffic. I mean, you get some, the point is, is like, there is a process here. And I think we've realized that, especially in competitive spaces, like biz, biz op space, you know, the make money space, the self-development space constant lead gen is an absolute must. So you got to have a good front end lead magnet. You got to have something to be able to give away in exchange for a name and an email address. And then utilizing those audiences in your launches is, is, a, is a, a strategy for success. Are you finding people, Ralph, are using YouTube ads in this scenario? It, to me, it seems like, oh, you're watching a video and then you're, how does you, where does you, where do you find YouTube ads fall in? I haven't seen that. I mean, I know that there's some people that have used YouTube ads for uh, webinar lead gen. Uh, I haven't not seen as it. Common. It's not as common. Um, you know, we do a fair amount on YouTube and a lot of that is boosting of content or going straight to a potential offer, especially if it's, you know, it's in the multiple hundred dollar range, but um, we've had a couple of customers that have added on to their Facebook spend for a webinar. And the, the scenario that we usually we use for YouTube and or for a webinar when it comes to video itself is what's the most important part of that webinar? What's the big thing? What's the big idea that's easily implemented is maybe a small chunk of the overall content that's being presented on the webinar that can get them the quick win right now. And we use a, a video strategy called the teach and pitch, where we might start off with some kind of way in which to gather their attention and then give them some little tip and then say, hey, if this was helpful for you and you can visualize yourself actually utilizing this and getting the result that you're looking for based upon whatever my product happens to be, I've got you know seven other things that I teach a lot of my students and I'm holding a, a free webinar next Tuesday, click the link in and around this video to register. So we found that video is really, really effective. The cost per registration to a webinar is typically higher, but because they've consumed a certain amount of content, the show rate is also higher. And then once again, when you're using video on the front end, same as on YouTube, you can then retarget those audience to make sure they show up. 
And we all know that the show rates for webinars aren't what they used to be way back in the day. So that's really the key. And then obviously tying that back in with a good email sequence. So getting them to show once you get the lead is as not, if not more important than getting the lead itself, because it's relatively simple to get the lead, but you ultimately want them to get on that, that webinar, consume the content, and ultimately hear the pitch at whatever point that time is, and then ultimately purchase, which is the next logical step. Ralph, um, one part of your site that I like, and I want to encourage people to check out tier11.com, and it's T-I-E-R, and then spelled out E-L-E-V-E-N, tier11.com. I love the manifesto pitch. Okay. So I encourage people to check it out. And one part that I like, you know, the, the, who's who we like to work with, who's you know, people in the companies that we, you know, shy away from. Um, mm -hmm. One part I want to ask you about is one of the bullets says customers who are not prepared to work with us, even though they think they are. So that's you. What, what does that look like? They think they are, but you're identifying, no, you're not really ready. What is yeah, that like? it's a, it could be a potential list of things. Um, it, it, the, the most glaring example of that is the one who comes to us and says, okay, um, I've got this new product and I just need an agency to just get it out there and you guys are going to do all the magic and all I've done is create the product and you guys take it from here. That raises a lot of red flags for me, unless it's a current customer. And we do this all the time for customers. Like, all right, you've got it. They're going to launch a new product. Yeah. They're going to launch they a new they're... product. That's a whole different thing. If it's to a completely different audience, there's a conversation that goes on there. But if it's an add on or it's slightly different, it's in the same niche, no problem. We'll certainly do that. And that's part of our service. We don't know who they are. I, I mean, and our team is pretty well uh, schooled on how to do this tactfully. It's like, I typically will tell people like, listen, guys, I don't know who really you are, but unless you're prepared to spend $30,000 a month for four months, probably about 120 grand to test and figure out, or I try and give them a big number to kind of scare them off a bit. Like, unless you have that runway, we have no idea whether or not the world wants what you have. So what I would do instead is get out your credit card. You know, we've got some training that we can, we can give you or, and you do it on your own, test it out for a couple of months and then come back to us. If they're really adamant about hiring an agency, we might reference it out to partners of ours that, um, you know, work with, with smaller customers company. with maybe smaller budgets, yeah. that kind of thing. So, because it, at the end of the day, it's like, that's the formula that we found really doesn't work. Um, now the flip side to that is, so for example, we have a customer who's coming on board. They, they do $25 million in direct mail sales. Like they have an offer that works and they have runway and they're a mature business, but they have not been able to figure out Facebook social anything digital and they've got a great business that's a very different conversation and that's one that we would engage in but i would still give them the same answer is that we are it's going to take 60 to 90 to 120 days to really figure this out so let's talk about a budget how we're going to be able to do that what our kpis might look like as we figure out this digital thing but we're going to be pulling a lot from what you're currently successful doing in the offline world, very different conversation. So somebody not ready to work with us is, uh, you know, I'm a guy with an offer and all I need is an agency. That's really not yeah. our thing. Yeah. They're missing a lot of key components. They haven't proven it out. And if you haven't proven it out, you can't really scale it. So I totally get that. Um, right. The, I know we have a little bit of time left. I wanted you to talk about, you know, running a hundred percent virtual company and some of the things that you do to maintain culture, you go over 60 people, they're all over on different continents, different countries. What are the, some of the things, you know, everyone can learn from you about helping culture when we're all over the place in virtual? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this is not something that I, I purposely when I said, I'm going to start a virtual company and then that's like, now it's a, a thing, but 
uh, after the second time I was fired, I had 20 years in the corporate world where I was running sales teams and I ran uh, the East Coast sales division for a Fortune 500 company was doing great. You know, that was when, you know, they realized I was doing this moonlighting thing on the side, which I had my own blog and then they fired me as a result of that. But anyway, that's a whole other story. But my teams and there were, there were you know, hundreds of salespeople and multiple dozens of, of district sales managers who all rolled up to me and I was running in essence a virtual sales team. I would go out into the field and visit with you know, either a DSM or maybe a sales rep or an account executive. I would do stuff in the field, but the, most of the time I was sort of running things from either the office with a couple of days in the field in the middle of it. And I got kind of adept at how- You had to wrangle salespeople. That's, yeah, that's not an easy sales. job. Yeah, it was not an easy job for sure, but- it was one that I actually really in, enjoyed doing because I think it's, you know, as any business owner, you know, this like selling is such an essential skill and I didn't learn how to do it in college. I had to go out and figure it out on my own. Um, so there was a basis for a business there. And I never really felt that the office environment was all that important. Now there is value to it no matter what, but there's pros and cons. There's the commute, there's the wasted time, there's the boss sort of looking over your shoulder. And I said, you know, if you can hire the right types of people who I just trust to do the job. At the end of the day, I was running sales teams and it was all about, it doesn't matter. I don't really care how many hours you work. What I care about is that it's the numbers at the end of the month, the quarter, your quota, all that. So it was very much I managed by behaviors and actions so much so that I realized that I wasn't ever going to be somebody who said, you need to be out in the field at eight and be back at home at five. It, like it just didn't matter. So that type of mindset I brought to the company and I said, well, if I hire the right types of people who have these five core characteristics that we now hire for inside tier 11, one of which is drive, you know, sort of drive to succeed, then I realized that you can build an organization without having to have them physically check in with you. And it was all about, in our case, it's all performance marketing. Like the client can fire us in 45 days notice. So, <laughs> and at that point in time, I was paying basically everybody based upon our revenue. So they were highly incentivized to do the job as best as they possibly could. And what we found, Jeremy, in running a virtual organization is that once you get the right people in the right seats on the bus, so to speak, uh, it's not about getting them to work more. It's actually putting benchmarks in place and guidelines in place for them to take time off. Because more people at Tier 11 I've seen suffered from burnout because they didn't take the time off than they did because they were lazy or got, we got rid of them because they weren't doing their job. It was everyone was overachieving. So, I think if you trust people to do the right thing and you hire the right types of people that fit within you know, the tenets of your organization, I think it's a really good formula for success. And we have a very good hiring process. And like I said, we, we hire for five core characteristics and it's, it's worked out really well for us. And those four are drive, what else? Well, it's really, it's uh, hunger is drive, is humble, hungry, smart, precise and get shit done. Those are the five that we look at. Now we just amended get shit done too. I know we're going to get an explicit <laughs> rating now on iTunes, but GSRD, get the, or GRSD, get the right shit done. As opposed to just working, what we noticed mm -hmm. is that people who you don't have to ask twice to get something like I asked once. It's like, when can you get that to me by? Oh, I can get that to you by Monday morning at 8 a.m. I set my little Slack, you know, reminder if I need to. And sure enough, they typically will send it by Sunday at midnight. So the point is, is yeah, there is those five components right there. So humble, hungry, smart, smart is more emotional IQ. Okay. And then precision, which is really important in our business. You've got to be precise, whether you're writing ad copy, you're buying media, you're a dev person. And then last but not least is GRSD. So Ralph, well, I don't know if you have to hop off. I had one last question. Um, 
you know, and I want to point people towards tier 11, check out tier 11.com perpetual traffic, the, the podcast, they do amazing work there. So check everything out. Um, a quick follow-up on that is time off, right? How do you bake in time off into the, the company for people? Yeah. I mean, because we're a hundred percent virtual, we're all independent contractors and it's the way that we've always done it uh, with 20, I think it's actually 27 countries now. Our payroll would be an absolute nightmare, plus with all the sort of local laws and everything else. So we, we run this by our legal team every single year. And so we run things that way. And that's the way that we've always done it. Um, as far as time off goes, it's compulsory that everyone gets three weeks off. That's 15 days. And we don't say specifically holidays, um, but it, it's written in to our agreements and not necessarily our agreements, but it's, it's written in our SOPs that you have to take this time off. And we, we monitor it and we actually have someone on staff who makes sure that people are taking time off and like people don't get burned out because this is like, it's 24 seven with advertising. That's our, our, you know, the internet never sleeps. My kids used to say that the internet never sleeps and neither does dad, you know, now I sleep thankfully, cause I have really good people, but I make sure that they sleep because that's our biggest safeguard. As long as we've got those five key characteristics, our core values, whatever it is that you want to call it. It's like, we make sure that people do take time off and are good for them, are good to themselves and take care of themselves. Um, because we've seen the, the, the downside of working too much. And in some cases, you know, I've certainly seen it on my end. And even in some cases for people who have worked in tier 11, unless you put in those benchmarks as much as you possibly can, this business can really take a, a, a toll on you. And we try to prevent that as much as we possibly can. Everyone check out tier11.com, Perpetual Traffic uh, Podcast. Check out Rise25, Inspired Insider. Ralph, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. What I've got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 